Now the definition. Actually, we have two definitions for uh, birth asphyxia. One uh, definition regarded as the highly precise scientific definition, which is used in the high resources societies or medical centers. Be uh, it means contain the criteria of diagnosis of asphyxia. And we have a, a clinical uh, definition, which is used in low resources uh, center or low resources environments. So we will start with the low center or low resources. Clinically, it is a pathologic condition referred to a neonate who have no spontaneous breathing or represented regular breathing movement after birth. So that's why we always ask if the baby crying immediately after birth or not, because we say the crying is the most efficient breathing or spontaneous breathing. This is the clinical definition, but the scientific or the high resources uh, uh, definition, we can call it, it is a hypoxic insult to the fetus, severe in enough to cause three, metabolic acidosis, neonatal encephalopathy, and multi-organ system dysfunction. Actually, uh, uh, birth asphyxia, it is a birth injury. We can classify the birth injuries into two types, hypoxic ischemic injuries, and physical injuries. The physical injuries, we can call it the birth trauma. It will be the subject of the next lecture. But the hypoxic ischemic injuries, we can call it the uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy because it affects more, mainly the brain, or we can call it the perinatal asphyxia. So perinatal asphyxia uh, describes a clinical entity whereby uh, the fetus or the newborn infant sustains an impairment of respiratory gas exchange, and this will reflect an acute respiratory failure because if the patient cannot take a breath uh, 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 spontaneously, of course, there will be a failed respiratory gas exchange, and uh, after time, there will be hypoxia and hypercapnia, or an increase of the uh, CO2 in the blood, and this is called the acute respiratory failure of the type 1. Now, uh, before coming into the details of this subject, we have to know these uh, uh, definitions, because very important, and we will repeat it more than one time. Firstly, anoxia. When we say anoxia, we mean complete lack of oxygen in the cells or organ. While when we say hypoxia, of course, hypo, it means decreased availability of O2 in the cells or organ. And we refer it to as the PO2, as the partial pressure of O2. Now, sometimes we call it hypoxemia. And when we call, uh, talk about hypoxemia, so we uh, mean the decreased arterial concentration of O2, rather than the tissue, the cells, or the organ. So this is the difference between hypoxia and hypoxemia. But of course, the significance of hypoxemia, it will lead to hypoxia, or it will be uh, accompanied uh, by hypoxia, because the, the end result of decreased arterial uh, concentration, of course, there will be decreased availability of the oxygen in the cells or organ. And we have the term which is ischemia, because we call it hypoxic ischemic. So, what is ischemia? Ischemia, as you know, it is insufficient blood flow to the cells or organ to maintain the normal, uh, uh, to maintain their normal function. So there is cessation or uh, decrease in the blood flow to that organ. So, now, what are the epidemiology? We say uh, uh, it is important, it is a frequent, it is common. So, what are the epidemiology? The epidemiology of birth asphyxia differ according to the societies. So, in developed countries, it will be low. It's just about uh, uh, up to one in 1,000 births in, in term infants. And the uh, uh, neurologic disability will be significant in just about 0.3%. You know the percentage decrease, and this reflect what? This reflect the improvement in the in neonatal care that uh, uh, perform and that uh, 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 given to the, that uh, asphyxiated baby to make the significant neurological disability to a lesser degree. While in developing countries, of course, the percentage or the incidence will increase. It will be up to one to six per 1,000 live births. And uh, this statistics <coughs> done by WHO in, in, in uh, 2008, yes, uh, it is uh, uh, about more than 12 years, but it is the, uh, the most uh, large statistics and the last that we found 
It takes that about uh, nine a hundred thousand total infants die each year from birth asphyxia. And this is making it a leading cause of death for newborns. We have a list of leading cause of death in newborns. One of them, it is birth asphyxia. And in the United States itself, the intrauterine hypoxia, and uh, look at the uh, uh, definition here or the term intrauterine, not uh, uh, that's mean a prenatal, before the delivery and the birth asphyxia, that's mean that happened during or after, it listed as the 10th leading cause of neonatal death. This is a high percentage, even in the United States. So, and this is a study as example that done by one of the large uh, medical centers. We found the primary causes of neonatal death, and you can see here the perinatal asphyxia composed the highest one at 29% uh, of. And uh, 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 in this statistics that take a huge uh, number of uh, neonatal death, about 4 million uh, neonatal death worldwide each year that found the asphyxia uh, comprise 23% uh, and it lies uh, uh, just behind the uh, uh, infections and the preterm uh, or the prematurity, uh, which is very high percentage. Now, uh, that's what uh, why birth asphyxia or perinatal asphyxia is very important. And we say also it can be prevented, so the intervention can be done at the appropriate time to decrease its incidence or at least to decrease its complication, the early and the late complication. Birth asphyxia is not just the leading cause of death, it is the leading cause of neurodevelopmental disability in children. So that's why when we are uh, uh, examining or when we are dealing with a patient with neurodevelopmental disability, one of the most important questions we ask is this baby has birth asphyxia during uh, 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 or immediately after birth? And we ask uh, the, the common question about the immediate crime because it is the leading cause of neurodevelopmental disabilities more than the infection or, or congenital anomalies. The term perinatal asphyxia, as I said, it is preferred to use uh, uh, more than birth asphyxia because it reflects what happened uh, uh, before, during or after birth. And of course, and when we are talking about birth asphyxia, we are talking and a top emergency condition that need rapid and urgent treatment. We call it the resuscitation regarding the babies. Now, what are the prenatal risk factors for asphyxia? That's mean, can we anticipate or can we uh, uh, predict birth asphyxia in, in some deliveries? Yes there are a group of uh, uh, prenatal risk factors. We can call that uh, what is related to the mother herself. So uh, an extreme maternal age, less than 15 or more than 35. Maternal diabetes mellitus, maternal use of drugs and preeclampsia. We can anticipate or we can say this is a risk factor. Causes or factors related to the placenta itself, placental abruption or placenta previa. Causes related to the pregnancy period, like post-term, pre-term, or the type of pregnancy, multiple pregnancy, it is a risk factor. Or causes related to the fetus, it's inside the uh, uh, uterus, like mouth presentation and abnormal lie, this may lead to difficult labor. Meconium stained amniotic fluid, the fetal radicardia, which reflect a fetal distress, and the premature rupture of membrane. All these are risk factor. Presence of these risk factor is not necessarily mean this baby will has birth asphyxia. But I said, you have to anticipate that your baby may undergo this uh, stressful condition to the level of perinatal asphyxia. So you have to uh, prepare, uh, uh, prepare yourself for doing the intervention at the appropriate time. Now, what are the uh, 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 etiologies or the causes of the birth asphyxia? Summarily, anything that can be uh, an event that comprises or compromises the blood and oxygen flow to the fetus, it will lead to birth asphyxia. We said it is hypoxic, ischemic. So decrease in auto supply or decrease in the blood supply. Now we can classify it into a three global factors antenatal factors, 
the intranatal factors, and finally, the postnatal factors. We will review in details. Now, if we are talking about the antenatal factors, we can refer to one of the most important, or maybe the most important. We are talking about the placental insufficiency. So anything that interfere with the placental insufficiency uh, or placental vascularization or supply to the baby while he is inside the uterus, it may lead or it may cause birth asphyxia. So again, we can uh, divide the antenatal cause into uh, maternal factors, something related directly to the mother it's herself. First is when there is an impaired maternal oxygenation due to anemia, the mother has severe anemia or pulmonary diseases or cardiac or neurologic diseases. So there will be hypoxia in the mother, but a hypoxia that's not be harmful to the level of the mother herself, but it will be uh, with defective oxygenation coming to the baby. So this is a maternal cause. Decrease of blood flow from the mother to the placenta due to maternal infection, shock, dehydration, or hypotension. This is mean an acute illness. The mother health generally is normal, and the oxygen supply and uh, her blood is normal and going normally to the baby, but because of acute severe illness or critical illness like those, the blood flow to the, uh, from the mother to the placenta will be decreased. Now, I will skip the placental factors and I will go to the fetal factors. Then I will go to the placental. Now, antenatal factor, but related to the fetus inside the baby. Like what? Increased fetal oxygen requirement due to fetal anemia, fetal infection, or severe intrauterine growth retardation because of congenital infection, as example, or chromosomal abnormalities. Here, the blood supply and the auto supply of the mother is normal and of the placenta is normal, but the baby need a requirement more than the normal because of these problems related to the fetus herself. If I will back to the placental factors, because we say it may be mostly placental insufficiency. Here, the mother is normal, the baby is normal, but the placenta has something uh, abnormal. Like what? Decrease the blood flow from the placenta to the fetus due to placental abruption or cord prolapse entanglement of the cord, or through knots of the cord, cord compression, or abnormality of the umbilical vessels. This is a primary cause related to the placenta, making it uh, defective in a blood flow. Or sometimes there is maybe an impaired gas exchange across the placenta or the fetal tissues due to maternal hypertension, or vascular disease, or diabetes mellitus, or drug abuse, past post-maturity, placental calcifications, and infarct or fibrosis. Look at the group of these diseases. Although this is in the mother, but it not affect the oxygenation or the blood supply of the mother herself. It affect the blood supply or the gas exchange across the placenta. So it has a, a direct effect on the placenta, making it the primary cause for the antenatal birth asphyxia. Now, if you are going to the intranatal factors, that means the baby, the placenta, the mother, all are normal before the beginning of birth. But these events happened acutely during the delivery. So what are these? Adequate oxygenation of maternal blood, like what happened due to hypoventilation during general anesthesia or cyanotic heart disease, the mother and resting, uh, uh, sorry, cyanotic congenital heart disease in the mother or respiratory failure or CO poisoning. This may happen uh, during the time of labor. That's why in the uh, antenatal history, we always, or in the natal history, ask about the mode of anesthesia used, if it is a, a GA or a spinal anesthesia, because again, spinal anesthesia has a negative impact. How? Low maternal blood pressure that happened during the delivery due to acute blood loss, severe hemorrhage, or spinal anesthesia, or great vessel compression by gravid uterus, all this will lead to hypotension and lead to decreased blood flow to the placenta. This happened acutely in the intranatal period or intranatal time. The uterine titany, this is mean oxytocin, uh, oxytocin induced, and this is mean 
uh, a continuous uh, contraction of the uterus during labor. And you know, the continuous contraction, it will lead to decrease uh, the blood supply and the auto supply. That's why it is intermittent to uh, uh, make a point where the blood and auto supply go through the, um, from the placenta to the fetus during the uterine or intermittent uter uterine contraction. Premature separation of placenta also will decrease the blood supply and the auto supply at the time of delivery. And compression or notic of umbilical cord that happened during delivery and the placental insufficiency due to toxemia or post maturity, the effect appear here, the defect of the placenta appear at time of birth. Now, the causes that is related to the uh, baby, so it call it the postnatal factors. What about the postnatal factors? This means failure of oxygenation. Now, the mother was completely well before the delivery and was completely well during delivery. The problem in the fetus or in the baby because of respiratory distress or fetal cyanotic congenital heart disease. So he cannot tolerate the birth process, which is called the most stressful condition or event the life may uh, 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 face or severe anemia. The baby has severe anemia because of severe hemorrhage or severe hemolytic disease. So he may, this may interfere with taking a breathing or will lead to birth asphyxia or uh, postnatal asphyxia. The baby may have shock due to sepsis. From where the sepsis is coming? Congenital infection, ascending infection while the baby was at the uh, uterus. Massive blood loss like intracranial hemorrhage. The baby may have intracranial hemorrhage or adrenal hemorrhage. This will lead also to birth asphyxia. And a deficit in the saturation, the autosaturation, due to failure of breathing adequately after birth because of a cerebral defect. We have a congenital condition called anencephaly. Here, the most part of the brain is missed congen uh, congenitally. And so, of course, the respiratory center will be affected. So there is a hypoxia or there is a narcosis, narcosis that given during the delivery, I mean to the mother, so it, it will pass it through the placenta and affecting the baby, or the baby may uh, 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 undergo a birth injury leading to the decreased saturation. Now we are finishing the uh, causes or the etiology of birth asphyxia. Now we all talk about the physiology of birth asphyxia. That's mean what happened when the asphyxia occurred. Well, okay. This uh, uh, diagram will uh, uh, explain what happened during uh, birth asphyxia. So, when babies become asphyxiated, that means cannot or undergo the condition of asphyxia, I mean decrease the O2 or, or the uh, hypoxia or ischemia. You know now. So this is either in utero or after delivery. The baby will undergo a well-defined sequence of events. We call it the primary apnea. Then it followed by the secondary apnea. So what happened in a primary apnea? When infant is deprived of auto for one cause or another, there will be a response of the baby by initial a brief period of rapid breathing. This is what happened. Then the baby, if the deprivation of the auto will continue, so the baby respiratory movement will cease, will stop, and we are in the primary apnea. In the primary apnea, not just the uh, breathing is stopped. The heart rate also start to decrease and the blood pressure also start to decrease. The muscle tone also will gradually diminish and the infant enter at the period of what's called the primary apnea. Here is at this step in primary apnea, the initial steps of resuscitation will induce a breathing. And we will know what are the initial steps of his station later on. Now, if 
we don't interfere or the asphyxia continue. I mean, the causes of deprivation of O2 and blood supply will continue. So the infant will develop a deep gasping respiration. A deep gasping, you know, the gasping respiration. This here, the heart rate will continue on decreasing and the blood pressure will start to fall more and the infant become nearly flaccid. We say the gradual movement, sorry, we say the a, a, a gradual movement of the baby decrease in the primary apnea. Here, no, the uh, patient become nearly uh, flaccid or uh, a, a complete a floppy baby. He cannot move any of his limb. And the baby enter a period of what's called a secondary apnea. Now, the secondary apnea here, the intervention is not by simple or initial steps. We need something to do actively to interfere with. So this is what happened in the normal history or natural history of birth asphyxia or the physiology. Now, I will repeat it in this way. We say oxygen deprivation for one cause or another. There will be a rapid breathing, rapid breathing of short period leading to tachypnea. Then the primary apnea. It is reversible with the simple measures like the stimulation. If the oxygen deprivation didn't stop or increase as this is a show, so the patient will take gasping and gasping the breathing, and he will enter into the secondary apnea with a reversible to stimulation. And here the ventilation is a must. Now, I will take you to the uh, delivery room and uh, we will see what we could do to patient or to baby immediately delivered and what are the interventions to prevent this equally if it's happened. One important question will be asked, is the baby cried immediately after birth or not? And this is for those attending the clinical course, you know how we are focusing on this question in the postnatal uh, history, in the birth history. If it is yes, so our patient need just rotting care. But if the baby cried immediately or not cried immediately, he need neonatal uh, resuscitation. Now, what are the rotting care? Simply, they are like providing warmth of the baby because he was in the uh, cold environment after going out to the uterus. It clear the airways if needed by sucker. Dry the baby because the wet baby will be in, uh, uh, at the risk of hypothermia. And monitor, monitor what? Breathing, heart rate and color. I put it in the green color because this is just the rotting care. Then you can hand the, 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 the baby to the family. While the neonatal is a station, here is in the orange, so the condition may improve or may worse. What you have to do? The initial steps, I mean all these, these called the initial steps. Then the assisted ventilation the baby may need, especially if he is in the secondary apnea. So using bag and mask or what's called the ambo bag or even endotracheal intubation, or we may need chest compression with ventilation, this is called the CPR, and we may need medication. So the rule of A, B, C, D will be followed. Now, this algorithm, I will not take in details, inshallah, in the, in the next year, uh, you will learn how to perform it, not just to know it. This is authorized by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Heart Association, and this is uh, 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 since 2010, it is uh, uh, worldwide used, and even in our uh, uh, medical center. And uh, this is called the neonatal resuscitation program. The WHO and the, uh, and the American Academy of Pediatrics invent another uh, 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 algorithm for the communities with low resources called Helping Baby Breathe. This is an action plan. It is dependent on the unit resuscitation program, but with a simple measures that can be applicable even by paramedical staff 
or even by the uh, 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 relative of the patient. Now, uh, I will uh, take you back to the uh, physiology of the uh, birth asphyxia. You remember when we say about the primary apnea that happened after the uh, uh, tachypnea? Here, as we said, the uh, stimulation, tactile stimulation, or the initial step is enough to, to make the difference. But when the baby uh, uh, will undergo the gasping the breathing the, uh, and then the uh, secondary apnea, the heart rate and the blood pressure will decrease. Here the, we say that uh, 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 more advanced measures will be uh, uh, done, which is the assisted ventilation, even intubation or the uh, drugs, the using of uh, like the adrenaline. And in this period, the effect on the brain and on the heart will happen, of course. Now, in this slide, you can show again the physiology of the birth asphyxia regarding the apnea, the heart rate, and the blood pressure, and compare it with the PCO2 level and the acidosis, the pH level. But look at this point. Here is when the resuscitation started. I mean the assisted ventilation at the time of secondary or terminal apnea. So look at the changes that happened when you interfere with the baby. The heart rate will increase, the blood pressure will increase, and the pH will increase, that means the acidosis will improve, and the PCO2, which means the hypercapnia or hypercarbia, also will be corrected. This appear, how is the intervention, the resuscitation, and the appropriate time with the appropriate measures is essential to stop the events and to relieve the condition. Of course, this study done on the resus monkeys, but it can be dependent, dependent on the, or adopted in the units, in the human units. Now, according to that, and we know the importance of the intervention at the right time, we can say, the longer the duration of secondary apnea, the longer the duration of secondary apnea will lead to what? The greater is the risk for organ injury. So interfere as soon as possible with the appropriate measures. Now, what are the first sign of recovery for the baby? You see it from the last picture. The heart rate will increase, and the blood pressure also with improved perfusion. And I look at this fact. The time required for rhythmic spontaneous respirations to occur is related to the duration of secondary apnea. So you can predict or anticipate what is the time of the response of the baby regarding the respiration, not the heart rate, not the blood pressure. So for each minute, minute past the last gasp, that's mean we are in the period of secondary apnea. Two minutes of positive pressure ventilation using the ambo bag is required before gasping begins. For one minute, we need two minutes. For one minute of uh, secondary apnea, we need two minutes of uh, 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 positive pressure ventilation. The baby will take the gasp again. And four minutes, we need to reach to the rhythmic breathing. The breathing will be rhythmic. Four minutes for one minute of apnea. So if your baby has an apnea of four minutes, you need 16 minutes to reach to the rhythmic breathing. And eight, min and, uh, 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 eight minutes for the positive pressure ventilation. So what about the muscle tone? We say the muscle tone will decrease in the primary apnea and the baby will become completely floppy at the secondary apnea. Here, it will start gradually on the course of several hours. So the baby after improvement, he will be limping or floppy for several hours to again take his spontaneous muscle tone. Now, this inverted pyramid show the need of the intervention, the need of intervention in the resuscitation. Approximately, uh, sorry, approximately all all the babies, like uh, the frequency here, need the simple measures. But the percentage will decrease when we are advancing 
toward the advanced, like using the chest compression, just less than one in 1,000 may need the uh, chest compression or may need the adrenaline or uh, drug, just uh, six in 10,000. And, and uh, at the end, the volume expansion. So this is mean. Uh, the, all the, pa the babies need excessive and advanced uh, uh, resuscitation are much less than those need just the basic, which is the mask and ventilation uh, start with air, not with oxygen. Now, what make the uh, uh, resuscitation is of value? What make it? It uh, the so the objective way of determine uh, the progress in your action. It is not subjective. Someone, he will say, I will continue to resuscitate this baby. And the other will say, there is no benefit. No, this is mean subjective variations. But uh, someone, some lady uh, invent uh, what called Abgar score. And we will know what is Afghan score. It is an objective method uh, to quickly summarize the health of a newborn children. It is performed at baby, on baby, sorry, at one and five minutes after birth. And sometimes at 10 minutes and 15 and 20 minutes. The one minute score determine how well the baby tolerated the birthing process because he passes through the birth canal and pass out uh, uh, so this is the most stressful condition. This, is, this uh, first minute called the golden minute in the life of a uh, baby and, and human in general. The five minutes score tell how the, well the baby is doing outside the mother uterus. Now the baby is outside the uterus. How is tolerate the life inside this environment? The five minutes tell us about this. So in rare cases, as I said, the test will be done 10, 15, and even 20 minutes after birth. Who developed this uh, score? It is, uh, American, it is an American anesthesiologist, Dr. Virginia Abgar. In 1952, she invented this uh, Abgar and this score, and it take the uh, name, the hair loss name. And from that time, the world, the whole world, uh, start the decrease in the mortality and morbidity during labor and the infant mortality rate started to decrease because all the world start to follow this objective score. So as you know, and I, I think you know from the lecture of Dr. Zahra, Abgar, A, referred to appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration. Each of these signs can receive zero, one, or two points. So the full score is 10. And the zero score is zero because all are absent. What are the components of the score? But before going to the components, this is Dr. Virginia Abgar, and uh, this is a tribute to her soul because of her uh, uh, service or her help uh, the world in general to decrease the infant mortality rate. Now, these are the uh, uh, components, uh, these are the elements of the Abgar score and how we detect it. We just give the, uh, uh, the score for the finding that found in the uh, newborn baby at one minute and five minutes. And this show uh, what is, when we say the appearance, what is the uh, score zero, what is the remains, what is the, where well, there's no movement. So you can go back to it, but this is of course required from all of us as a doctor to know what is Abgar score and how we can calculate the Abgar score. Now, Abgar score assessment. At the end of doing Abgar score, you will uh, take a number and what the number reflect. If it is between seven to 10, this is mean good health of the baby and there is no depression, this is the optimal. If the score is four to six, this is mean the baby undergo a moderate asphyxia. And if the score is zero to three, this is mean severe or profound asphyxia. So uh, importance of Abgar score, it will be a part of the diagnostic criteria of the birth asphyxia scientifically and highly precise. 
Now, what is the effect of birth asphyxia? We interfere, but the asphyxia happened. What is the effect of birth asphyxia? The uh, asphyxia, it will affect all organs. It will affect the heart, lung, liver, gut, kidneys, but the brain, it is the most of concern. And perhaps it is the least likely to heal. So that's why we can call it hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So in more pronounced cases, an infant will survive, but the damage to the brain is manifested as mental damage or physical, affecting the developmental delay, CP, or intellectual disabilities, mental retardation, or uh, uh, both of them may happen because the brain is the most affected uh, system or organ. So if we are talking about the CNS, it will cause hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, referred to HIE, uh, cerebral infarction, intracranial hemorrhage, seizures, cerebral edema, hypotonia, or hypertonia. It affects the cardiovascular system, causing myocardial ischemia, and poor contractility, and tricuspid insufficiency, or hypertension, mean arterial hypertension. Pulmonary, causing persistent pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary hemorrhage, or RDS, respiratory distress syndrome, I mean. The renal, it will lead to acute tubular necrosis or cortical necrosis. Now, in the GIT, it will lead to uh, uh, perforation, ulceration, hemorrhage, and necrosis. The adrenal, which is very important, it may lead to adrenal hemorrhage. Metabolic, it will cause hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hyponatremia, uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, or myoglobinuria. In the integument, I mean the skin, it will lead to uh, uh, subcutaneous fat necrosis. And hematologic, it may cause uh, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Now, the most vulnerable organ, as I said, it is the brain. Why? Because it has a high, uh, it's a very high requirement for the oxygen and a basal blood flow. So, what the baby will do, how the babies uh, respond to this uh, fact? He will develop what is called a mammalian diving reflex, or we can call it a, a diving cell reflex. This is what happened, just like what happened in the aquatic mammals, like the seals. Uh, the aquatic mammals, when uh, some, uh, during the submersion under the water sea, uh, uh, the blood supply, the auto supply, will be shifting from the uh, organs different to the most valuable organs to uh, maintain their life underwater. This, this will happen for a short period in the babies. So we called it a mammalian diving reflex. When there is a shunting of a blood to the brain, heart, and adrenals. Look at the most valuable brain, heart, and adrenals. Away from where? Lung, gut, kidney, liver, spleen, and the skin. This is an attempt to maintain the perfusion to more vital organs. But this is if the asphyxia is worse, is, uh, 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 sorry, was severe or prolonged, this reflex will uh, fail to do the, uh, the result. Now, what are the changes that happened during birth asphyxia? Now we know the organs are affected, but what are the changes? Start with the biochemical changes. The hypoxia ischemia, this is the insult will affect what? There is decrease of water supply. The body needs energy, and the baby will do energy for breathing. He will do what? The anaerobic metabolism pathway will start to act, and anaerobic metabolism, of course, to, to produce energy, it will lead lactate, and the lactate will go to lactic acidosis, and this means metabolic acidosis, accumulation of an organic phosphate. Continue with the accumulation of the uh, excitatory amino acid and the damaged tissue, like the glutamate. What this will lead to? Increase this the excitatory uh, amino acid lead to increased amount of intracellular sodium and calcium, which is against the normal physiology. So this will lead to what if the sodium inside the cell increase? Tissue swelling cellular edema, and of course, when we talk about the brain, there will be cerebral edema, which is the most significant one. Continue with the biochemical 
chemical changes. Hypoxia impairs the cerebral oxidative metabolism, resulting in acidosis. Acidosis because of the lactic acidosis, and there will be decrease in the ATP level because of the failure of energy. And we have another type of acidosis, which is the respiratory acidosis. And why? Because there will be a failure of the gas exchange, if you remember in the beginning of the lecture, and there will be acute respiratory failure. So there will be hypoxia and hypercapnia, rapid elevation of PSA. So we have what's called mixed acidemia in the cases of birth asphyxia. This will lead to what? This will lead to a production of free radicals, more production, and nitric oxide in damaged tissue. Now, look at what happened when the acidosis occurred. Acidosis will lead to what? To myocardial depression. The myocardial depression lead to decreased cardiac output, and the cardiac output will cause in hypotension. The hypotension will result in decrease of blood flow to the brain, all the body, but to the brain. And decrease of blood flow to the brain will lead to more hypoxia and ischemia. More hypoxia and ischemia will lead to more acidosis. So as you see here, this is a vicious cycle started by the hypoxia and ischemia to acidosis. And it will, if we cannot interfere, if we cannot, cannot cut this cycle, it will lead to more profound and profuse uh, changes in that point. Again, with the biochemical changes, if there is no response because of the severity of the asphyxia or the failure of intervention, we will enter in the state of secondary energy failure. And in this state, there will be impaired iron pump, not just the sodium and the calcium. And this will lead to what? This in, on the intracellular and extracellular compartments. On the intracellular, this will lead to accumulation of sodium, chloride, calcium, and water. And we, there will be tissue swelling and uh, more tissue swelling and cerebral edema. And on the extracellular, it will lead to liberation of the uh, 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 potassium, excitatory amino acid like glutamate and aspartate. And this is called the secondary energy failure. That's mean more damage to the brain and more uh, uh, liberation of free radicals and nitric oxide. Now, what are the circulatory response of the fetus? How the baby respond to the circulatory response? First, there will be increased shunting through the dectus venosus and dectus arteriosus, which are still open, in addition to foramen oval. And there will be transient maintenance of perfusion of the brain, heart, and adrenal. This is called the mammalian diving reflex, as we say. In preference, then it will fail if the, there is no response or the severe uh, deprivation of O2. Then it will, there will be inadequate perfusion of the periventricular white matter, leading to what is called the periventricular leukomalacia. That happened especially in preterm babies. Now, there will be hypotension with time due to myocardial dysfunction, vascular endothelial edema, and capillary and hypovolemia. Now, even the real perfusion of ischemic tissue, and this is what we should do, but appropriately, because the reperfusion or hyperoxia or excessive management or aggressive management will lead to more damage. How? This will lead to more generation of oxygen free radicals, and with time, this will lead to more neuronal damage. So the birth asphyxia initially and with management, it carry morbidity and risk. This picture will uh, uh, show again what happened. There's hypercarbia, hypoxia, ischemia, acidosis, decreased heart function, and waste removal disruption. All these can happen as a biochemical and circulatory changes in the birth asphyxia. Now, what are the clinical manifestations of birth asphyxia? The clinical manifestation can be detected, can be noticed before birth, before delivery, at the time of delivery or after. How? Before delivery, if the baby has IUGR, so this is one of the earlier signs of birth asphyxia, or there is abnormal heart rate or rhythm, or decreased fetal movement, these are signs of fetal distress, which is a sign of birth asphyxia. At the time of delivery, what are the signs? Or what are the clinical features? 
Mechanical mistake amniotic fluid. This means the baby undergo a difficult labor, uh, so the meconium pass while he is still in the uterus. Oh, of course, we are going to the clinical definition when there is no spontaneous breathing or breathing with difficulty. After delivery, what we can see on patients with birth asphyxia. After delivery, there is a hypertonic state or, hyper, or hypotonic state. Both of them. There will be pallor because the decreased tissue perfusion, cyanosis, apnea, bradycardia, and no response to stimulation. Cerebral edema may develop during the next 24 hour and depression. Cerebral edema originated. Seizures, and the seizures here may be refractory to the all sense because of the direct risk of the injury to the brain or because of the hypoglycemia that happened and uh, or hypocalcemia that happened with the biochemical changes and now the uh, for these reasons the diagnosis of birth asphyxia is not uh, straightforward or it is not easy to do so that's why the american academy of pediatrics and the american college of obstetrician and gynecologist put a criteria for the birth asphyxia. These criteria put at 1996, but up to uh, 2016, the American Academy of Pediatrics revised this criteria and uh, keep it on the uh, way of diagnosis of birth asphyxia. First, profound metabolic or mixed acidemia, mean pH less than seven, and umbilical artery blood sample. Persistence of Abgar score less than three at five minutes. Neonatal uh, uh, encephalopathy manifesting as seizure, hypotonia, or coma in immediate neonatal period, not later on. And evidence of multi organ dysfunction, for example, the kidney, lung, liver, heart, or intestine. All these, all these should be present together to say this is a birth asphyxia to differentiate the neonatal encephalopathy happened in these cases from other causes. All these should appear, all, this, all these should present because neonatal encephalopathy, it can happen for uh, another causes, especially when the gestational age is uh, more than or equal to 35 week of gestation. It may be due to stroke or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or brain stem damage, or other causes like infection, malformation, metabolic causes, or trauma. So the criteria of diagnosis of AAP and the American College of uh, Obstetrician and Gynecologists is to differentiate these causes, the HIE from other causes of neonatal encephalopathy. Now, what is the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy? Of course, from its name, there is a lack of oxygen with restricted blood flow, affect the brain, causing brain damage or what's called the brain uh, or uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. It's referred to characteristic neurologic manifestations in term and near term uh, newborn. And uh, the, uh, it's in about less than 50% of the cases, the brain is the only organ that exhibits this function. So that's why in the criteria, the multi-system organ dysfunction. And up to uh, more than 80% of the cases, there will be involvement of other organs other than the brain. Its incidence is one to eight, and a half of them will progress to moderate or to severe high, uh, uh, ischemic injury. And uh, uh, it may lead, or it's important cause to permanent damage. Look at this, permanent damage to CNS, either leading to neonatal death or manifested later on as cerebral palsy or developmental delay. And about, uh, you can know the uh, percentage here, about 30% uh, of them will die in neonatal period, but those survivors will, about 50% of them will have permanent Neurology, neurodevelopmental abnormalities like CP or mental retardation. Now, the brain damage that happened in uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, it differ according to the gestational age of the baby, whether he is term or preterm. And you can see here the 
uh, uh, area affected accordingly, and according to this, the clinical presentation also will uh, 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 differ. Now, these are the most vulnerable areas of the brain that are affected by the hypoxic ischemic insult. This, these are the clinical signs and symptoms of birth asphyxia summarized in this picture. You can revise it. This includes the level of consciousness, the activity, the posture, tone, reflex, and the autonomic nervous system. But because of the variation of the presentation, so we depend on a staging system for the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, classifying it into stage one, two, and the three mild, moderate, and severe, according to these parameters appear here. And this is important to know. And the outcome also will differ according to this classification between good in stage one and death or severe deficit in stage three. Now, what are the investigations that should be done to patients with a birth asphyxia? Actually, there is no confirmatory laboratory test for diagnosis. All what done, is just to assess the severity of a brain injury and to monitor the functional status of the systemic organs. What are the investigations? On the top, I will put the MRI with high specificity and sensitivity to the brain injury. CT scan and focal hemorrhagic lesions like in the, in, involve the basal ganglia. Ultrasonography, this is a preferred in preterm because it may be uh, 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 important in detection of the uh, uh, intracranial hemorrhage that happened in them. The amplitude integrated EEG uh, is very important and helpful in determining the risk of developing long-term brain injury and detecting the seizure activity. Sometimes the seizure is not apparent to us, but the EEG, it will register or will record it. The blood sugar, the uh, ABG, I mean the arterial blood gas analysis, the autosaturation, serum electrolytes, renal function test, liver function test, and coagulation profile, all are important in the uh, supportive management of patients with uh, birth asphyxia and all reflect the, assess uh, the severity of the condition, especially in the immediate situation, in the immediate neonatal period. Now the treatment. When we are treating patients with uh, birth asphyxia, we should know the goals of the treatments. First is to save his life. So we should maintain the temperature, the airway, the breathing, and the circulation. Although he may have a significant neurodevelopmental loss, but your job is to save his life. Optimize the cardiac output and cerebral perfusion. This will decrease the, uh, uh, the long-term outcome. You have to maintain the autosaturation and you have to uh, uh, treat uh, or prevent the hypoglycemia. Now, first, and what is ascending in the importance in management of uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or in general birth asphyxia is the therapeutic hypothermia. Here we have two types of hypothermia, selective hypothermia or just on the cerebral or whole body or called systemic hypothermia. This, the action of this hypothermia, it will reduce the mortality or the major neurodevelopmental impairment. In term and near term, you know, while in preterm, the extreme term, it have no rule, of course. How it will act? They found it, it will decrease the rate of the apoptosis, the, the death of the cell and suppress of the production of neurotoxic mediators like the excitatory amino acid and the nitric oxide. We have two types, either isolated cerebral cooling or systemic hypothermia, or what's called the servo-controlled hypothermia. We aim to reach the core temperature of the baby about 33.5, look at the level of hypothermia, within the first six hours of life, and this is a gradual decreasing of the temperature. And the duration of this hypothermia is up to 72 hours. This will lead to reducing the mortality and the major neurodevelopmental abnormalities. How the process can be summarized in this picture. You can uh, uh, go back to it to see its effect. Again, first six hours of life and the duration is 72 hours. We said we have two types. This is called the cooling cap. This is have a, a, 
tubes uh, will cause a cooling of the brain with cold water. This is another picture showing the cooling cap. And now this is what is called the servo controlled uh, hypothermia by using a blanket underneath the baby. And this is the cooling device. This is called systemic. Whole the body will be hypothermic. This is another form. This is a rubbing blanket. This is called the cooling blanket, rubbing the blanket. You can see the monitors and now, the hypothermia therapy has complication like thrombocytopenia, bradycardia, subcutaneous fat necrosis, and potential for overcooling and cold injury. Now, the other uh, point of treatment is the anticonvulsant to control the seizures. And the drug of choice here is phenobarbitone. Give it a loading dose and maintenance dose. And nowadays, even they talk about the prophylactic dose of uh, uh, phenobarbitone up to 40 milligram given in one hour to prevent the further uh, damage to the brain. Not to those have uh, convulsion. Phenytoin is alternative. And lorazepam can be used also for those not responding to both uh, above. But avoid the diazepam because it will lead to respiratory depression. So it's contraindicated in the natal period at all. Now, supportive care is very important to management of organ system dysfunction accordingly. And this is very important uh, point is to prevent the hypothermia before initiation of hypothermia. That's why we say, we say the hypothermia should be started in the first six hours of life, gradually, but without hyperthermia of the baby previously. Adequate oxygenation, maintain blood pressure, all these control the, the, uh, or, or, uh, the supportive care is very important. Even control uh, uh, possible infection because of the uh, more interference with the baby, he may undergo infection. So we should control the infection accordingly. Now, what happened in management of patients with birth asphyxia or with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy? Ideally, that will, will you see here. Here is the uh, ampl amplitude integrated EEG to recording of the uh, 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 signals or the abnormal uh, uh, behaviors of the brain. This is called the near uh, uh, infrared uh, uh, spectroscopy. This will detect or determine the oxygenation of the brain tissue, the brain cell, uh, and this is the cardiovascular monitor, the usual, and this is called the uh, transcutaneous PCO2 monitor. And this is the cooling device, of course, with the other IV lines and other uh, uh, auto uh, supplementation. This is the ideal management of patient with a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Now we will finish with the prognosis of patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. The outcome, it correlates with the timing and severity of the insult. What happened earlier or what uh, take a uh, uh, what was severe, so it will uh, come with worse prognosis. So the prognosis, it may range from complete recovery, as we see in the stage one hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, to death, and in between the neurodevelopmental sequelae. Early treatment means better prognosis, of course. Now, what are the bad prognosis? We can predict a bad prognostic criteria in patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. They are initial cord or initial blood pH less than 6.7. You remember in diagnosis we say anything less than 7, it is a garden acidosis and in birth asphyxia. But here 6.7, it's more or less. Low guard score uh, 0 to 3 at 5 minutes. Decelerate posture. You can go to the staging system and the decelerate, you will find it on the stage three. Persistence of severe uh, injury at 72 hours, because we say in a stage one, it will uh, less than 24 hours. And lack of a spontaneous activity. Now, the moderate encephalopathy, its mortality is about 10 to 30% while the severe encephalopathy its mortality in 60%, but disability in 100% of them. So finally, I will finish with the long-term handicaps of patient with uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. They are like developmental delay, 
the or delay milestone, microcephaly because uh, uh, improper or failure of organ uh, 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 brain growth. So we'll be, there will be microcephaly, a cerebral palsy, deafness, of course, sensory neural deafness, seizures, and which is uh, 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 refractory to uh, anticonvulsants, blindness, problems with cognition, memory, and fine motor skill and behavior. All these may be attained by the age of 18 months. Our job is for a further and continuous follow-up and assessment of patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and it needs a teamwork involving us involving the uh, neurologist, involving the uh, uh, specialists in the uh, ENT and in ophthalmology, all the teamwork here will act to assess the long-term handicaps of patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Thank you.